Welcome to PDE's lecture 18. Today we're going to do, get some preliminaries. Um, in the first part of the lecture, basically I'm going to review or at least introduce the notation I'm going to be using for Fourier transforms as well as delta functions um, and their connection with delta functions. And um, because just to get the normalization constants right, and if you haven't seen it before, to give you a rigorous definition of what I'm going to be using. And then the second part is going to be um, the Green's, deriving the Green's function for the wave equation. And I'm going to use Fourier techniques to do this. And um, what is nice is even though the Green's function for the wave equation is different in different dimensions and has vastly different properties, the method of derivation I'm going to use is going to be the same. Okay, so there's a general way of deriving the Green's function for the wave equation in all dimensions that makes the dependence on dimensionality very clearly apparent. And what I can say is the Green's function that we derive for the heat equation and the Laplace's equation, you can actually, especially the one without boundaries, in other words, the infinite um, uh, uh, what's it, Green's function, you can derive using this, this method as well. So if you remember over for the heat equation, Laplace's equation, there was this idea of either you seek the self-similar solution or you seek the um, symmetric solution, um, and then you have your infinite, the, the Green's function in the infinite domain, and from that you can construct certain Green's functions for certain geometries. What we're going to do now is to use Fourier methods to derive the Green's function on an infinite domain. And then you can once again go and s construct certain, um, the Green's functions on certain semi-finite semi and other domains using this technique. Um, and so in principle, you can go and derive the previous Green's functions we've derived using what I'm going to suggest today. Um, it's slightly more clumsy, but the advantage you gain from it is that you can do it for any dimensionality. So I just, sort of through the course, I wanted to introduce you to various calculation techniques that people have used to find the Green's function in the past. I'm not always sure which one was first, but I do know that the one I'm going to introduce today has had a huge influence on people that use Green's functions for particle physics and quantum mechanics. And in fact, the derivation I'm going to use sort of was systematized when they started deriving propagators in field theory. Okay, so it's a very cute, very concise derivation that can go for any dimensionality. And the reason that it is so nice is that when you start looking, or s people used it in field theory, is because when you start looking at certain things about particles, four dimensions is weird. Okay, there's certain things that diverge in four dimensions that we can't calculate. And so what they did was they basically used the, this method to work out the Green's functions in an arbitrary dimension and then take the limit when you go to four dimensions. So it's just a calculational tool that turned out to be very, very powerful for, um, for field theory. But in this case, it's a very cute derivation that actually allows you to get it for any dimensionality, and it's very nice to see how it works. Okay, so that's the hors d'oeuvre for today's <laughs> lecture. So let's first get to the definitions. Um, firstly, the Fourier transform um, we're going to define as follows. It's another example of a Stumlewell problem, but on an infinite domain. So once again, the theory I'm going to do straight after I've done the Green's functions for the waves equation is the Stumlewell theory, and you'll see how that then fits in. Okay? Um, but anyway, the Fourier transform of a function f of x, I denote by this f hat, and there's a different argument k, so it's definitely a different function, and I define it to basically be the integral of f of x times e to the minus i k x dx. Okay, so just like the examples where we solve the heat equation by expanding it a basis of sine functions, this is the infinite version thereof. And what we're basically doing is um, projecting this function onto various bases with different wave number. Okay, so it's almost a Trans it's, it's almost like f of k contains, f hat of k contains all the information f of k has 
except that it's all, um, stored in a different way. So it stores the frequency content, or it makes the frequency content apparent, whereas f of x makes the physical content apparent. Okay, so just an example, uh, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian curve that we've been working with is delta a of x that we showed the limit became the delta function. We can work out as follows. It's simply the definition of our Fourier transform. So it is delta hat of k is equals to 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, times the definition of delta a, times e to the minus i k x. And the nice thing about this is you can actually um, work out this full, what this, what this integral is, and the method you do, it, the way you do it is you basically complete the square, because remember we know what the integral from minus to infinity to infinity of a, del, of a, um, a Gaussian is, and so if we can write this thing in the form of a Gaussian, we once again can work out the integral. So what we do is we basically complete the square in the argument, so here we have it, we have e to the x over a squared, which is just that term. Then we want the second term, okay, and the minus sign has gone out in front, plus the second term, which is basically i k, and then I want to write it as something multiplied by x over a, because x over a appears there, and to, to fix that, I put in the a, okay? So that's this one is our second term, and then I add the final term, which is just this thing in front over 2 squared to complete the square, and then, remember that's a minus, and then to cancel this term out, which is actually not an integral, I add this thing in front, okay? And then the argument over here is actually the same, okay? So this line is exactly integral equal to that one, this thing is actually a complete square, and I can write it as follows. Okay, now the next step is I want to actually change this argument to an argument that's in my, um, my the thing I'm integrating over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let y be equals to the beast inside the bracket. And then, as a result, my limits change, and I simply have um, dy running over to that, and dy equals to that, of e to the minus y squared times dy. And this thing is an integral now in the complex plane, okay, where x runs, the real part runs from minus infinity to infinity, and you have y equals to i k a. And that you can actually, is the same as you can drop this i k a. And if I just can draw, and I don't know, if my, if my mic will reach. So basically what you have is you have um, I, K, A, or just K, A here on the imaginary part, okay? So that integral is running along there, um, and the integrand is e to the minus Y squared. The one where you actually, the one where we know the integral is when it runs along there, right? That's the one we derived earlier in class when the imaginary part is zero, and that goes to infinity. And so if you have a little thing that goes up, you can actually make a closed contour around the box, around like this, okay? And these go away to infinity. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity of that i, k, y thing is actually equal to the integral along here because the total integral of, on this whole thing is zero because e to the minus y squared is an analytic function and there are no residues inside of there. Okay, so what I can then do is simply say it's equals to that and as a result, 
I know what this integral is. It's just the square root of pi that cancels out there and you're left with 2 pi times this argument. Okay, so our Fourier transform of the Gaussian once again leaves us a Gaussian. And this is one of another unique properties of a Gaussian. It's very convenient and it appears actually a lot when we do physics as well because you sort of have a thing where the particle is actually confined as well as its Fourier transform. It's a very, very nice function for various reasons. Okay, so the Fourier transform of our Gaussian is another Gaussian, but its, its um, standard deviation is slightly different, um, uh, but not so much. Okay, so here we have the Gaussian, the, the Fourier transform of that function, and so they're quite closely related. Now, and the, but the most important difference is here the A is below the, in the argument here it's divided by, and here it is multiplied by. So the spiker, spikier you make your Gaussian, of which you're taking the Fourier transform, the flatter your Fourier transform will be. Okay. And in the infinite limit, which is what we're basically going to show, when the Gaussian, when you take the A equals to zero limit, when this Gaussian curve becomes infinitely spiky, okay, here when A equals to zero, that basically goes to zero up there and you have a flat transform. So there we go. And the A equals goes to zero limit, you have your um, Gaussian curve going to your delta function and you have your transform going to a constant. Okay, so very nice because it sort of just, once again, puts everything into a rigid, rigid structure. And what it also permits us to do is to work out the Fourier transform of the delta function of x minus y. And the way you do that is simply to put in the delta function into this definition, okay? And the del one of the delta function's properties is if you put it, convolve it with another function, it is merely the function when the argument is equals to zero, so it's e to the minus i k y over two pi, okay? So we have a definition for the Fourier transform of our delta function, which is also going to be useful later on. So I'm basically just deriving all the all the properties of the Fourier transform that I'm going to be used in the following derivation. Okay, so given the Fourier transform, there's a way to go back, just as when we did the heat equations and we used those sine series, we could go to, we could go to the expansion coefficients and then we could use the expansions to reconstruct the series. So too, you can work out the inverse Fourier transform. In other words, if you're given if hat k, um, you can work out what the original function was. And so just to give you an idea of how we can actually derive that, let's just examine what happens when we take, take our Fourier transform of our Gaussian, we multiply it with e to the i k y dk, and we now integrate over k. Okay? Um, if we do that, we have this integral over here, and once again we can work this thing out by completing the square, just as we did down here. Okay, so I'm not going to actually do it again. And we expect, in fact these integrals are so similar, we basically, so there it's completing the square, and then we basically expect that we once again get our Gaussian. Okay, so that gives us the first hint that the definition of the inverse Fourier transform it must be something like this. Okay. So that's actually delta A of Y. And if we now take the limit as A goes to zero, we can see we've worked out um, a, delta, a definition for our delta function of Y, and yet another one in terms of a Fourier series. Okay. So you can view the infinitely spiky delta function as being made up of um, infinitely many um, oscillating terms with faster and faster frequency that combined in just the right way to make the little spike. 
Okay, but this thing is actually useful if we want to rigorously derive the inverse Fourier transform because what we can say is let's consider this combination just as hinted at over here, we sort of think the inverse Fourier transform should be something like this. So we take our f hat of k times eta minus i k y. And what we do now is we simply replace f hat of k with our definition of f hat of k is. In other words, what the definition of this transform is over here. We multiply it by e to the i k y and we integrate over decay. And then we can go about and we can rearrange things and switch our order of integration because we're going over an infinite domain and we're assuming our functions are bounded at infinity or rather the, the product of them are bounded at infinity. And then what we get is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the i k, y minus x dk times dx. And now if you look at this thing, we've proved up here that that's just the definition of our delta function. So we now have f of x, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, times the delta function of y minus x dx, um, and that is simply f of y. Okay, so we actually now have rigorously shown that this thing is the inverse transform of the Fourier transform, and we're done. Just notice the difference between the two. The Fourier transform has a factor of 1 over 2 pi in front here, and the inverse transform has not. Okay, and this is partly the reason why I give you the stuff up front. There are different conventions of doing it. Some textbooks will actually split and would define their Fourier transform as this, put a square root in front of that thing over the 2 pi, and then add another square root in front of, the two, of this thing. It's not the way I choose to do it. Okay? It's just a convention, but this is the consistent convention I'm going to be using for the rest of the lectures. Okay, so we're now going to define, whenever I talk of the inverse Fourier transform, f hat of k, that is given by that. Any questions at this point? You've seen Fourier transforms before. Quickly, okay. Well, the error's quickly again with all the stuff I'm going to need for, for, the, rest, for the rest of the derivation. Okay. Um, just a number, number of more properties of the Fourier transform. The one is derivatives. Okay. So let f hat of k be the Fourier transform. And then we work of um, a bounded function f of x. And we want to work out um, what the Fourier transform of f df dx is. Okay, so we're going to have a new function, g of x equals to f prime of x. We're going to work out the Fourier transform for g. And by definition, it is just this thing. Okay, and now to derive what that thing actually is in terms of f hat of k, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate by parts. Okay, and that's where we re use the fact the function is um, bounded or basically goes to zero at infinity is that in we basically going to discard the boundary terms. So here we have the integral over that, um, and we if we integrate by parts, it becomes f of x times minus d dx of this thing, and so we get the i k. The boundary terms are gone, and this, so we have this equivalence. Um, the ik we can go out and take out in front, and what we're left with is exactly the definition of f hat of k. So we have that the Fourier transform of the derivative of f is equals to ik f hat of k. And you'll recognize this because we had something similar when we were expanding in terms of cos and sine series. When we took the derivatives, we always had that ik factor coming out. Here it's exactly the same thing because you can actually consider cos and sine series as a combination of there's a, a relationship between the Fourier transform and the cosine transform. Okay, but it's just here it's rigorously shown. And similarly, you can just keep going. So if you want the Fourier transform of the second derivative of f of x, it's just ik um, applied twice. So it has the very powerful property 
that derivatives of the Fourier transform, the derivatives of the function translate into an algebraic operation on the Fourier transform of the function. Okay, just be careful when you're working out this relationship holds, right? Uh, G hat of k is equals to i k f hat of k. Um, when you start working out, it's, you, the going backwards is you must be careful with, right? So if you are given the Fourier transform of the derivative of a function, okay, and you want to work out the Fourier transform of the function, then it is true that f of if hat of k is equal to g of k over i k everywhere except for when k equals to zero. When k equals to zero, you have to look at it more carefully. Okay, and I'll do that maybe in an exercise um, for some of the Fourier transforms, just to show you that there's actually a second term that comes in at the zero part. So this statement is always true. If you want to, if you know the Fourier transform of the derivative of the function, you actually want the function. You've got you, it's fine to divide by i k, but you must know that there's an extra term that happens when k is equal to zero, and often it's a delta function that comes in. Okay, so there's just the cautionary there when you take it the other way. Similarly, that statement is always true, but once again, you can't immediately integrate it. Okay. Now, just to do it in basically define the Fourier transform in two dimensions, and this is the sum of a generalization that will, it's, you can basically extend it to any dimension, it's simply the product of the two ordinary Fourier transforms. So suppose you had a Fourier transform of f of x1 and x2, and you defined it that way, just formally, f hat is k1 and k2, um, then the definition of the Fourier transform is f of x1, x2 times e to the minus i k1, um, k x1, x2, sorry, uh, e to the minus i k1, x1, and then times e to the minus i k2, x2, um, taking the integral of x1 over x, uh, the yeah, integral of over x1 and integral over x2. So it's a very natural extension of the definition in one dimension. Um, and so if you write it this way to make that even more apparent and to actually give you the way of generalizing it to every dimension, let's, let's call x this vector of x1, x2, um, and k the vector of k1, k2, then you can express the Fourier transform of f hat of k as 1 over 2 pi a to the 2, the integral over r to f of x e to the minus i k dot x dx squared. And you can see the, sorry, you can see the immediate generalization to, to d dimensions, right? So suppose you were working in a d dimensional system, then you would replace the 2 over there by a d, you would replace that by a d, you would replace this by a d, but then the definition would still hold. And similarly, you can actually formally show as well, using exactly the same method we did for the 1D Fourier transform, that the inverse Fourier transform is simply f hat of k e to the i k dot x. Um, and I'm missing, I made a mistake here, that should be dk. Okay. Um, and similarly, you can now also define the Dirac delta function in two dimensions as 1 over 2 pi squared times the integral over r2 times e to the i k dot x d squared x. Okay, and this also holds for higher dimensions. Okay, so you've done Fourier transforms in all dimensions. Uh, and here I'm actually going to give it to you. So, okay, so denote the spatial coordinates that way, the Fourier coordinates that way, the Fourier transform of x is then just, yes, yeah, so I've just written it down, what I've been saying. Okay, um, some properties of an ND Fourier transform. Okay, so the same thing holds as what same expressions hold, and it can be derived directly from the one dimensional things if you're working in Cartesian coordinates. So the Fourier transform of a gradient, so remember the gradient of F is a vector of um, N dimensions in a D dimensional space, 
it can be computed by noting that the, um, the gradient of f times e to the i k dot x is simply equals to the gradient of f times e to the i k dot x minus f times the gradient of that thing. Okay, so that's just straightforward algebra. Then um, this thing constitutes a boundary term because you apply the divergence theorem if you do the integral over all of x. So, and we assume f basically goes to zero at infinity, so that thing vanishes and you're left with minus f. The gradient of this thing is simply um, minus ik, so you're left with the fact that, there we go. So the gradient of e to the minus ikx is simply i times the gradient of k dot x times e to the minus ikx, which is equals to minus ik e to the minus ikx. And so using the definition of our Fourier transform, we have that this expression is equals to ik times that expression because the boundary term has vanished and if, but this is just the Fourier transform of f in n dimensions and so we have that the Fourier transform of the gradient of f is simply ik f hat k. Okay, so exactly the same property we saw in one dimension we carry through in the Fourier transform um, to n dimensions and the reason it works so well is because it's basically a linear transform. Right, we've taken a linear combination of basis functions and as a result we have these properties that come through. So the same way you can actually do that thing twice and the Fourier transform of um, uh, the Laplacian of e to the minus ikx is just um, the divergence of the gradient of f which we've actually worked out um, minus um, the divergence of f times the gradient of e to the minus i k x plus f times the Laplacian applied to e to the minus i k x. These two are boundary terms and if f is bounded they vanish and we're left with this term. Okay? And we have that the Laplacian applied twice to e to the i k x is simply equals to minus i k, that's applying it once times the gradient, and that's equals to minus k dot k e to the minus i k x. And so that k squared is now the norm, and you're left with the fact that the Fourier transform of the Laplacian of a multidimensional function is equals to minus k, where this is the norm of the k vector times f hat of k. Questions at this point? Okay, so there it is formally. This is your go-to place if you want to actually do the derivations yourself. I've put everything I use later on in here, except for inverting this type of derivative thing, which I'll come back to in the next exercise. Now, um, let's go for the wave equation. Okay, so I'm somewhere going to start in the full generality of the Green's function for the n-dimensional wave equation and what we're going to do is do exactly the same thing as what we've done previously. So um, I'm going to basically um, introduce an operator which will they actually call D'Alembre's wave differential operator. I'm I think I'm not sure if it was in this form when he used it, but it's definitely subsequently been called that. So um, it's a, it's, we often denote it by a box, okay? And it's simply the Laplacian, which is this thing squared, minus ddt over c squared, okay? And if you've done anything in special relativity, you'll recognize that this is simply the Laplacian in a non-Riemannian manifold, the equivalent of a Laplacian in a non-Riemannian manifold. But anyway, this box squared is simply defined to be that. Um, and we're going to assume that this is in 
n dimensions. In other words, this operator, the, the gradient operator there, is an n dimensional operator. Okay, so now what we want is we want to solve this problem. So suppose we have the wave operator squared is equals to some source. This vector r is an n-dimensional vector. You have the time coordinate and you have divided by c squared just to keep everything consistent. And we're going to, instead of solving this problem for every single possible source, we're going to say let our Green's function obey um, this box operator equals to a delta function in n dimensions times a delta function in time. And we're going to assume that the, t the Green's function is equals to zero if t prime um, is greater than t. Okay, so the same idea as we had with the heat equation where we had this upper lid where the Green's function was vanishing. Um, the same thing we're going to do for the wave equation. This is interesting because it provides solutions um, that most of the people thought were the right ones. Okay, There is another option. It provides solutions that basically assumes you have nothing coming in from the future. Okay, So it's an assumption about causality. It's put into your answer and for most physical problems you solve, it's the right one. When they started using it for particle physics, they used it the same thing. And the consequences that you can draw out of that, there are a group of people that are now questioning on whether it's actually rigorously right, if there isn't something possible to come in from the future or not. But that's going way beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, but, but it's an interesting, it's, it's a causality assumption, not rigorous. It does give you the right answer, though, when you're actually physically solving the problem. Um, but there are other solutions you actually can find. Okay, so here the delta function is the n-dimensional delta function. The vector is this, where the i's are simply the, um, the um, unit vectors. Okay, in n dimensional space, um, and the xi's are the coordinates in n dimensional space. Okay, so there's everything defined, and so what I'm going to do is once again over here, we are going to have this idea of a, um, a source point and a field point. Okay. The field point, we're going to assume the Green's function everywhere above this is zero. In other words, above t prime equals to t. So up there it's zero. So the field point is only being influenced by the source points for t prime less than t. Okay. Here we're going to assume you start on your initial condition over here at the bottom where t prime is equal to zero. And all the things below that going up to this point as the potential at, at this moment to influence this point. We're going to say the domain has a boundary, okay, and that boundary we're going to denote by gamma, okay, and for each, in some sense, time slice, you're going to have a specific boundary, okay. So here, for example, this line is a part of gamma prime of zero, okay. So, and I just drew a non-standard domain that we haven't seen to basically emphasize you can do it for any domain, go through, well, at least the derivation. Finding the actual Green's function on arbitrary domains is hard, so we'll just do a few examples <laughs> that, we, that has been historically done. Um, okay, so the method of proof for constructing the Green solution is very, very similar to what we've been doing all through the thing. In fact, it all hinges on in writing the, the, Green's, the combination between the Green's function and the unknown u in a way that we can use the Gauss's divergence integral to try and connect the actual solution of u with the Green's function itself in the domain, the, the value of u on the boundary, and the value of u on the initial condition. And so to see how this comes out explicitly for the wave equation in any dimensions, Let's make this combination. So once again, we're going to make the U um, wave operator G minus G wave operator apply to U. So this is now combines the space and time. And 
we're simply going to write that out in terms of our spatial variables and our time variables. So here is the spatial part that we've seen already with Laplace's expression. So it's just that part of the operator. And now we've got to find the contribution of this thing. And we're going to have there it's a time part. Okay? So that's the combination. And once again, we now want to write this as a complete divergence. So we can write this thing as the divergence of u um, grad g minus g grad u. And um, there's basically no boundary terms because the other, the, the grad grad terms cancel each other out. Okay, so that's the one divergence we've got. The next one, we can write this for the same reason. It's just basically a one-dimensional version. We can also write that as a derivative with respect to t prime of u g t prime minus g u t prime. Okay, so now we guess we're basically going to integrate over t, and that's going to go from zero to some big t, and we're going to integrate r prime, in other words, our source point over this domain, which I'm going to call omega. And remember, potentially omega can change for different times. Okay, you can have a thing where you have a small domain and it expands like that. Um, for all practical purposes, we're just going to stick to um, a domain that remains constant. Um, I must, however, say that all the results we get, the special things on the boundary that you tweak, but the, print, the sort of the basic idea holds if you expand it. And um, this type of thing where you have an expanding domain is actually used quite a lot in quantum mechanics, where you shift, actually you change the potential of a, a experiment that you're doing, and then your domain actually changes. So um, there is a place for considering domains that depend on time. For our purposes, we're just going to stick to a domain that's constant. Okay, so let's now do the integral. The first one is, um, the first thing is we integrate over the left-hand side, so we're just going to consider this red part. And to understand that integral, we're simply going to look at our properties of G and U. So we know that the delambration of g is equals to these two delta functions. We know that de the delambration of u is equals to the source term. Okay, and so we basically going to put those things in. So we know that this thing is now equals to u times the delta functions. Okay, so that's the first term minus um, a g times the source term. Okay, and just by definition of our delta functions, we have that the argument is replaced by um, basically the value of r prime is replaced by r, and the value of t prime over here is replaced by t. So we actually have the function that we want to know. Okay, so our construction is starting to work. And then the second part, we have g times by um, a g over c squared. And what I've used over here is this bound. I've changed it from 0 to an arbitrary t to, which I had up there, to 0 to t prime because of this definition that g is equal to 0 if t prime is greater than t. Okay, so that's the thing that's come in here, and that's why that assumption is necessary. It also, if ever you want to be crazy enough to start exploring things where you have things coming in from the future, this thing is no longer going to be true. You've got to be careful. But we won't do that for now. Uh, maybe someday. So... The right-hand side is, in other words, let's now explore what happens here, where we actually work out these divergence terms. So basically, these are boundary terms now, so we apply the divergence theorem, and what we get is that 
This first term is simply the integral from 0 to t times the integral, so I'm just looking at the spatial part, the, uh, the, I've applied the bound, divergence terms to the spatial part, so it's the integral over the boundary, which is the normal of the boundary, in other words, the vector, say, over here, that basically points out perpendicularly to the, that normal, dotted in with this combination, times the integral over the boundary, so this ds is basically uh, n minus 1, it's basically an n minus 1 dimensional integral, times dt prime. And what we, in the second term now, with respect to time, it's the integral over the whole domain, okay, omega t prime, evaluated at t prime equals to 0, and at t prime equals to t, um, of this combination, okay? Since um, the Green's function is 0 for t prime bigger than uh, t, this top thing is 0, basically, and we're left only with the latter term at the bottom here, the initial condition term. Okay, so there we have the statement I've just made, and so the final result is that the Green's function is this top integral, okay, where I've replaced the n dotted in with the gradient of g just with the g's normal derivative minus g times u's normal derivative over the boundary um, times this thing, which is our initial condition. And so our Green's expression for u of r of t is simply this one equals to that thing. So it's a bit misaligned, but it's basically the two blues are equal. And this is then what we can use if we found our Green's function to reconstruct u. Okay, and if you look at it carefully, you have just the Green's function and a known function g, your source term. Your Green's, the derivative of the Green's function which you have, and you can have either u specified or its normal derivative on the boundary. Um, or, in fact, a combination of them. And, you, and over here, you have u, which is the initial condition you know, as well as the derivative of the initial condition. Remember, it's a second-order equation in time. You need to specify both u and ut. And then you have this gt and g, which you know. Okay, so that is how, if you get the Green's function, you can now reconstruct what your actual solution is. And the next difficult, or the next aim, is actually to try and compute those green functions. Okay, so there I just wrote out the whole expression for u in terms of the green's function, um, which is the whole blue thing on the previous slide. And for an infinite domain, which is what we're going to start with first, because you can only use the Fourier transforms that I've defined previously on an infinite domain because all integrals are being taken over an infinite domain. So on in an infinite domain, you basically, an unbounded domain, you're going to consider the case where g of n approaches 0, the normal derivative approaches 0, and g approaches 0. So once again, you're assuming that nothing comes out from infinity. It comes in from infinity. For now, this is a fine assumption it's not an assumption that you always use. There are cases where you're actually interested in waves coming in from infinity. Um, we're not going to look at those. Maybe, maybe just in the very last, when we start looking at KDV equation, we'll look at that a little bit. There is a way of dealing with it, a very cute way of dealing with it, very nice mathematics as well. Um, uh, but for now, we're, not, we're going to assume that those things hold. Okay. So if you on an infinite domain, you're basically going to have this boundary term vanishing, so it simplifies our problem. Okay, and so the second term vanishes, and what you're left with is this. So for now, this is what we're going to be looking at. Okay, and what we now want to do is to seek a solution G that solves this thing, um, and has G equals to zero if T prime is greater than zero, is t, t prime is greater than t. In other words, only source terms below your um, field point are of interest. And the first thing we're going to do is examine the equivalent of the symmetrical solution that we did in the past. 
Okay, so to do that, we're going to say let um, R be the difference between the source and the field point vectors, T be the difference between the um, source and the field time, and suppose that G, in other words, suppose that into your G, only the difference of, these, of the source and the field point is important, so we're going to assume that G um, bar has basically this property. Okay? And now, this is where the very powerful machinery that allows us to write down the Green's function in any dimension starts being developed. We're going to say, let G hat KW be the Fourier transform of our symmetrical assumption. Okay, so we're going to assume that we can write G, we can basically def take the Fourier transform of this thing and then get this G hat of K and W and we can then express G hat of R and T in the following manner. Okay, so we don't know what the Fourier transform is but we're basically using it to get a representation of G bar like this that's going to allow us to change the ideas of differentiation on G to algebraic properties. Okay, so that's the key. So we going to, we've got a basically, a, I'm not going to say an ansatz because it's not that. It's basically the Fourier transform. We've got a different representation of G that's going to allow us to actually algebraically solve this differential equation. And that's the right way to say it. Okay, so the equation for the symmetric Green's function then is base, it becomes this thing, okay, because, because we've defined R and T just to be um, the source point minus the field point and the source time minus the field time, and because this operator up here was acting just on the prime variables, in other words, the, um, the source points, um, we can show that this operator is actually can act, act on R and T rather than just R prime and T prime. Okay, so here, this is just writing down exactly what we have. Um, except that here this TT is now acting on the difference between the two, which is still valid, and this operator here is acting on the, on the R variables. Okay. Um, and so that is true just because R and T are basically um, the source point minus uh, the, the field point. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the Fourier transform of this whole equation and what we get is that, right? Remember I derived that the Laplacian applied to G is just the norm of the vector K multiplied by its Fourier transform and this thing, the second derivative over here, is simply... Um, uh, omega squared, because that's how I define the Fourier, the thing that goes in front of the W in the Fourier transform. So it's just omega squared over C squared multiplied by G hat K of W, and that is equals to, um, remember the Fourier transform of the delta functions is simply constants. So it's 1 over 2 pi N and 1 over 2 pi. Okay. Very powerful, right? You've got now an algebraic expression for G, and all we're going to do is now invert that in various dimensions. Okay. So, here we go. So, now we have what the, Fourier, what the um, symmetric Green's function actually is. It's simply taking the inverse Fourier transform of G hat of K and W. Okay, um, and this is an n-dimensional th uh, thing, the integral over K, and here's that constant factor. Here is actually what G of K is. It's simply this constant factor over this, this argument over here. And 
most of the rest of the skill is actually correctly and carefully interpreting what this thing means. Okay, but you can see now it's the same, this expression is the same for every single dimension that there is. Okay, so one thing we're going to do first is we're going to integrate over W, finished. Um, and then, because that's true for it, regardless of the dimension, and then after that we're going to look at the remaining part and evaluate that integral for the various dimensions. So integrating over W will leave you with something that looks like this integral I over W times E to the I R K dnk, where this constant term has been taken out. Okay, so I'm just grouping the terms again. And this IW is this thing. Okay, if ever you do a really advanced course in field theory, you'll see a lot of these integrals. Okay, and it's just the way, and it's, it's, it's basically what Feynman and Schwinger generalized for more object particles and more bigger structures is basically things like this. Um, you would call this a propagator. It becomes, you know those Feynman diagrams, it actually becomes ways of systematically dealing with integrals like this. Okay, so it's nothing magical or whatever, it's just, um, it's just mathematics that's been written in a way that it's easy to find combinations. But what is amazing though, is when Feynman developed it, he didn't understand the mathematics behind it. He, didn't, he couldn't actually rigorously derive his, what his pictures meant in terms of mathematics, but he could, he'd, he'd combined them in a way that it worked. Brilliant guy, but mathematically not as rigorous. And what happened historically is at the same conference we find when did it for the first time, you had a very poorly communicating Schwinger that was in his own head, like, like stuck. He gave a really unimpressive talk where he actually derived similar things to Einst to Feynman using the rigorous mathematics that he'd gotten from Green, which is why he admires him so much, just pushed further, um, and that could actually do the same thing. And he was very upset afterwards that everybody would listen to Feynman because it was easier to calculate even though it wasn't rigorous. And it took a couple of years for the two of them for people to actually show that the two approaches were the same and that both had something to add. Feynman gave a very quick way of calculating, organizing the calculations. Schwinger gave the rigor. And the guy that combined the two was a, another very brilliant guy, Freeman Dyson, that used to be at Princeton. And that's what formed the foundation of um, particle physics. And uh, what's interesting is, so you sort of see how different characters combine, sort of add something different to the, to the discussion. And um, Schwinger, even though his system was mathematically much more rigorous, uh, but when Dyson showed that the two were the same, people could get other results from Schwinger's approach um, that they could not get from Feynman's. And so the two systems work together very, very nicely in the end. But anyway, so this, this is sort of where the, the stuff begins coming from, okay? We're just going to use it for the purposes of writing down our Green's function, but it was generalized to some tremendous success um, when people started doing particle physics, and it's a starting point for particle physics. So once you have this foundation, you should be able to actually go and read some of the, the, the more complicated particle physics textbooks as well. Um, one way of looking at it just properties of differential equations and solutions and stuff. Um, for the physicists, it becomes a different world of particles and things you can control and actually do experiments with. It's, yeah, it's interesting how actively your mind can mirror what is going on in the subparticle world. Okay, so back, back to actually doing the mathematics. Um, so first thing, we're gonna actually want to work out this integral. Okay, once again, it's an integral that we can view as being in the complex plane, mine on the real line, okay? And the way we can evaluate it is also using what we know about the complex plane and what we know about residues. Um, so, and here's where it comes in. So, if you look at this integral, you have an analytic function, which is the exponent. You basically have two poles in W, 
at w equals to ck and w equals to minus ck. And so what you have is you basically have two, you have different ways of choosing the contours. In fact, you have, I'm going to give you two, you actually have three ways, which I didn't label. Um, so you have possibilities, or two possibilities at least I'm going to show you, is you have the Green's function, um, if one that will give you the Green's function if t, t is greater than zero, and one that will give you the Green's function if t is less than zero. And remember, t is the difference between the source point time coordinate and the, the field time coordinate, so it's t prime minus t. And so here we have the two possible integrals. So here are your two poles. Okay, so ck and minus ck. Here you have um, t less than t prime, so this is the one integral. And here you have the t greater than t prime, so this is the other integral. We've made sure that both the integral goes from minus infinity to infinity on the real axis. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, the other possibility is you could choose the loop to go around a different, different way, but it actually results in a different, in the similar type of integrals. Okay, so you have these two possibilities, and this is why I said that it's an assumption that G, it's something you've put into your G when you say that it must only be, um, when it must be zero, only below your T prime equals to T, oh, sorry, above your T prime equals to T. And so that assumption we use, we implement by simply choosing one of these two contours. That's what the assumption is doing. And so the A, okay, is actually what they call the advanced screens function that people are currently working with playing with to do weird things. Um, the one we're actually going to use is B, which we call um, the Tata Green's function, which preserves cause causality. So I'm just telling you, you don't have to remember this, so I'm just telling you why we actually, because I'm actually going to integrate the thing for you, why we chose the one we did. Okay. And how people, and the basic thing is people went back later, and the reason they started looking at things that come in from the future is initially it was obvious to them that they should use the one that preserves causality until they started playing with these quantum mechanical experiments where they showed that there's no hidden variables and you have this collapse on two different spots and that was weird and they didn't know how to explain that and then they started looking at things that go beyond that but we'll, that's a different course entirely on its own okay so we're going to choose B um, so we have that G is non-zero only for T prime less than T. And we're now going to evaluate the integral using the residue theorem. And so what we do is to remind you what the residue theorem is, it's simply if you do the integral of a function over a contour gamma, it is equals to... 2 pi i times the residues of f at the various poles. Okay, so I think you should have done this in complex analysis. <laughs> you didn't? No. Oh. Okay. You should have. You should definitely have. Okay, so I'll explain what a residue is, and then I'll, just wor I'll work out this integral exactly so you can get an idea of it. But you did do the integral that the integral, uh, if, if your function is analytic, that this thing is zero. That's just Couch's theorem. So you've done that. And, okay. Let's, let me go on, and then if you have questions, ask them. If the things I do stepwise is unclear, then ask me. Stop me and ask me. Okay, so AK are basically the poles. Um, enclosed by the co positively con um, orientated gamma. Okay, so what you do is you basically have your function f that's in the integrand. You work out everywhere where you basically have a pole. In other words, where the function goes infinite in the fashion of 1 over x minus z0, where the pole it actually is. So for this particular example, you have poles at 
minus CK, sorry, at CK and minus CK. So the two poles are over there and over there. Okay. Um, and by positively oriented gamma, it basically is that you have to transverse the contour in a positive fashion. Okay, so in order to work out what um, the residues of this function is, the way I do it is you've basically got to go to each pole and then do the Fourier series expansion of the function at that pole. Okay, in this particular example, it's easier to simply write the function um, as this. Okay, in other words, I have an analytic function times something that goes to zero that diverges like one over z minus ck. Okay, so this is defined as your pole. And there's your second pole. Okay, so what I have now is I'm writing it that way so I can easily compute what this residue of f at the pole is actually is. Okay, and the residue of the pole at f is simply, okay, so I'm basically going to just write out this integral. Um, so it's simply the function, this function evaluated at z equals to ck. So in some sense, it acts like the, um, the dominant term of the function once you divide or multiply it out with the pole. So let's look at this contour integral. What you have is the integral from minus infinity to infinity f of z times the integral over c of r over there um, times uh, f of z. And that equals to um, minus 2 pi i the residue of f at ck plus the residue of f at minus ck. Over here you must check, right, I'm put in the minus sign over there. That comes because this contour has to be positively orientated and this contour actually isn't. Okay, so that's what the minus sign is because it just flips the order. Um, so this contour over here, number A, is positively orientated, so I wouldn't have to switch the minus sign, but this contour over like this way is not. Okay, so that's where the minus sign comes from. I now have to work out these residues of F at CK and F at minus CK, and they are simply the function evaluated at CK. Okay, so that's literally why I wrote it in this term. I cannot take that thing and put in just the CK over there. It's not going to work. I've got to write it as some function times the pole uh, minus some other function times the pole. Okay, so the residue at CK is just this thing minus the residue at minus CK, which is that thing. And so I've actually got an expression for this integral because this gray thing um, actually goes to um, zero um, at infinity. Okay, so I'm left with the, the thing on the circle vanishes, goes away, and then the residues of the remaining functions is just these two things. Right, questions. Okay, so I haven't, I didn't do the reduced residue theorem rigorously, but I at least hope you can see what I did when I evaluated it. Okay. And so this, what I basically then do is I just use, write these two exponents as sine, because it's actually a real function, as it should be. Um, and I combine the two exponents and I write this as 2 pi over ck sine of t um, times ck. 
Okay, so that now is basically my integral IW. Okay, and the reason is that the function is assumed to basically go to zero on the boundary. And so my Green's function in any dimension is equals to this expression. It's now an integral over an n-dimensional vector k sine of tck, and this k is the norm of the vector, times e to the i r dot k. And if you can evaluate that in any dimension, you have the Green's function. Nice. Um, the integral, however, on a green on is quite sensitively dependent on dimensions, and we systematically going to go through one dimension to derive what we already know, and then go on to two and three dimensions and see how it varies, because it dramatically changes the way things propagate. Okay, so just think about it. If you're in one dimension, we had in our first problem set this idea of your wave, that if you have zero initial velocity, the wave just breaks down into two bits. The one goes that way, the one goes the other way. But the total amplitude of the wave remains the same. Okay, now if you think of water, right, suppose you were to take a hump of water just in two dimensions, or a mem let's say a membrane in two dimensions, and you were to spike it very much and you were to let it go, it would propagate like with ripples outwards, but those ripples would decay. Okay, and so that Green's function must actually include those properties as well. If you're in three dimensions and you make a spike and you let it propagate outwards, it would decay and it would decay faster than in two dimensions. Like in two dimensions, we're going to work out how it decays. In three dimensions, it'll decay like one of R squared. So the amplitude will fall off very, very rapidly. And that's also hidden in that little equation. And we're going to systematically like pull it out and see how it comes. Okay, so it's dependent on dimensions. And now let's just do the one-dimensional thing now, and then we'll do the other dimensional things in the next lecture. Okay, in one dimension, the things that work on dimensions, we basically have to work out what this thing, r dot k, is. Okay, you have to work out what this area element is. And then you have to work out what k, the norm of the vector itself is. So the easiest is actually to write everything in terms of the norm of the vector and r. So in one dimension, this r dot k is either going in one direction in which it is plus r k, or it is going in the other direction. In other words, you either have r pointing that way and your k vector aligned with it, or it's going in the opposite direction. So you only have those two possibilities. And so um, if R and K are aligned or anti-aligned respectively. Okay, so those are the two options. And so we can evaluate that integral in that, in, in that way. And so we have the Green's function for one dimension is equals to K is assumed to be positive. Okay, because it's now it's, it's, we're basically looking at the norm of K. So integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over k sine t c k r e to the i r k plus the other option, if they're anti-aligned, minus r k d k. Okay, so um, we can now rewrite sine as the, uh, oh, so the first thing we can do is we can s combine these two expressions and for this thing here, switch the sign of k, that k goes to the minus k. So then we have the integral from minus infinity to zero for this term plus the integral of zero to infinity for the second term. So we've combined the two. So our integral has gone to min from minus infinity to infinity, e to the I R K over there, and here I've expanded sine of T C K again into its complex comp or its exponential components, and then I can basically multiply through, and I can write it this way. And the reason I'm writing it this way is that remember our delta function was e to the I K X, okay? And so 
what I have over here is some constant, so it's not exactly a delta function, but I'm dividing by ik over there, and I'm integrating over k. So it's 1 over 2 pi ik times this exponent times that exponent. And, but remember that we had that h prime over a when we were working with an error function. We defined uh, basically a function whose integral was the delta function. Um, sorry, the function, the integrated version of the delta function was this function. Okay, so this is that h that in the limit becomes the heavy side step function. So you have h prime is equals to delta of x. Okay, and so remember that we then could say that the Fourier transform of h prime is equals to i k um, h hat of k. And so that would be equals to 1 over 2 pi. Okay, because that's just the Fourier transform of our delta function. And so the Fourier transform of the heavy side step function, um, you can actually prove that, remember this thing is true always, and I said be careful if you go, if you divide. So if you divide by ik, you have the Fourier transform, which is 1 over 2 pi, 1 over ik. Okay, and... But when k is equals to 0, you have the spike coming in. And this is the delta x. And I'll actually step you through how to prove that in one of the problem sets. OK. But the fact is, this h hat of k is basically um, what's appearing over there. And it is, in fact, the Fourier transform of the heavy side step function. And so if you look at this thing, what we have... Um, is that this expression is actually equals to the heavy side step function of h um, of r minus ct minus h of r sorry h of r plus ct minus h of r minus ct okay and this, and the the reason this is is that that thing is actually just um, the Fourier transform of our heavy side step function, and these delta functions actually cancel. Okay, so um, what we've done, and this, if you look at it carefully, is actually the Green's function that we found for D'Alembration solution. Um, and what it basically is, is that g is equals to minus c over 2 if, in other words, ct is less than r and r is less than minus ct. So if you look at the, remember the heavy side step function is 0 if the argument is less than 0 and 1 if the argument is greater than 0. And what you're doing here is you've got one heavy side step function that sort of does... Um, sort of does this and you've got another one that does that and so the only non-zero part is actually between when R is in this inside this box and then you have this minus C over 2 coming in so you can actually show that this expression is exactly that expression and zero otherwise Let's see, did I stop there? I think I stopped there. And I'll, and I'll actually look at that more carefully the next time as well and then show you if we have the Green's function that is this thing and we have that earlier definition of what our solution is in terms of the Green's function, that is exactly the solution we derived previously. So I'll show that in the next lecture and then go on. Um, this derivation... I'm actually not going to ask you to know, but I just wanted you, know, you to know that it existed. Okay, so I'm not going to actually ask you to derive this thing again, but I just wanted to show you systematically how you got it um, and how I'm actually going to use this expression. So I'll basically 
give you this expression and then ask you to work out conclusions from it. Um, and I also wanted to show you how powerful it was that you have one expression in any dimension and then you can start getting the various Green's functions out of it simply by evaluating that thing correctly and we'll do that for the subsequent dimensions next time. So that's all from me for today. Thank you. Questions now? Huh? No, you're okay. You want to go?